Good morning and good afternoon to all of you joining online for this event today. My name is Emily Eberly and I will be your technical host. Here's a big thank you to Dale Medical Products, who is our sponsor for today's program. And this webinar is being presented to you in association with the Infusion Nurses Society. I welcome each and every one of you to our webinar, and we have folks registered from all over the world. And I want to thank you for joining us for our Perspectives webinar series. I will introduce you to your moderator, Joanne Phillips, in just a few moments. But first, I'd like to mention that this is an interactive webinar. We will have audience interactive polling today, and as well, we will be taking your questions live throughout the session. And now I'd like to introduce you to Joanne Phillips, who is the Manager of Quality and Patient Safety for Penn Home Care and Hospice Service at the University of Pennsylvania Health System in Philadelphia. Joanne, here's a very warm welcome to you. Are you ready to get started with our broadcast? Yes, Emily, thank you so much. Good morning, afternoon to everyone. My name is Joanne Phillips and I'll be your moderator for today. We welcome you to our session. We're very excited that you've taken time out to join us. Following throughout our presentation, we welcome your questions. They're very important a part of our presentation today. The title of today's webinar is Sound Silence, Reducing Nuisance Alarms in IV Pumps. Speaking on this very important topic is Catherine Major. Ms. Major is currently the Director of Caring Way and the Transitional Care Model for Penn Home Care and Hospice Services in Valley Kidwood, Pennsylvania. Prior to her current position, Ms. Major was a nurse manager at the Hospital of the University of Pennsylvania, where she had responsibility for three departments, including the Vascular Access Program. She's a member of the Association for Vascular Access and the American Organization of Nurse Executives. Ms. Major has authored or co-authored articles for peer-reviewed journals and has presented at several national nursing meetings. Ms. Major has no conflicts of interest in the development of this presentation. Without further ado, oh, excuse me, continuing education units. This education activity has been approved for 1.0 contact hour, provider approved by the California Board of Nursing, provider number 14477 and the Florida Board of Nursing CE provider number 50-17032. At the end of the webinar, you can obtain those continuing education credits by logging on to www.saxtesting.com forward slash P. Complete the post-test and evaluation form, and upon successful submission, you'll be able to print your certificate of completion. Without further ado, I would like to introduce you to my colleague, Catherine Major. And Catherine, let's make sure that your line's unmuted. Thank you, Joanne, for, t for that introduction. And thank you, Emily, for helping me with my technical difficulty this morning. <laughs> <laughs> and thank you to the audience for taking the time to spend with me today. I know that you're all very busy. So let's start off with the learning objectives. So our first objective today is to describe the risks associated with alarm fatigue, identify three sources of IV pump alarms, and lastly, to recognize the role of IV protection and the reduction of these alarms. Okay, so what is alarm fatigue? Clinicians can become desensitized or immune to the sounds and are overwhelmed by this information. We're surrounded every day by all of this technology and ways of signaling to the nurse that something might be going wrong with the patient, but sometimes there's just too many signals to be able to filter through. In response to the constant barrage of noises, clinicians may turn down the volume of the alarm, the nurse might turn the, volume, turn the alarm off altogether, or the nurse might um, adjust the alarm settings outside of the limits that are safe and appropriate for their patients. All of these actions can have serious and sometimes fatal consequences. Now it's time for our poll question number one. Nuisance alarms can result in alarm fatigue. Which one of the following behaviors is a result of alarm fatigue? Okay, so we have staff disabling the alarm, silence in the alarm, and staff ignoring the alarm, or all of the above. Good. 
So 96% had the correct answer that it's all of, the all of the above that can result in alarm fatigue. So the Joint Commission has decided to make this a national patient safety goal, 06.01.01. And the Joint Commission states that we all need to make improvements to ensure that alarms on medical equipment are heard and responded to on time. So this is a timeline of what Joint Commission accredited organizations are to be doing. So during 2014, leaders must establish alarm system safety as a hospital priority, and the organi organization must identify the most important alarm signals based on the following, from the input from the staff and clinical departments, obviously the risks to patients if the alarm signal is not attended to or if the alarm is malfunctioning, it's also important to determine whether specific alarm signals are needed or unnecessarily contribute to the alarm noise and alarm fatigue. There's also the potential for patient harm based on inter internal incident history and published best guidelines. As an organization, you need to decide which alarms you're going to manage. Some organizations are only going to formally manage cardiac monitors. Our organization here at University of Pennsylvania Health System is going to formally manage cardiac monitors, ventilators, pulse oximetry, and bed exit alarms. Now you notice that I did not mention IV pump alarms. Even though we are not focusing on that, the IV pumps alarms can still distract the, the nurse um, from these other signals that are being sent from the cardiac monitors and the ventilators and, and from the equipment like that. So by 2016, which sounds like it's far away, but really it's only six months, every institution that is joint, joint commission accredited needs to establish policies and procedures for managing alarms that were identified in the 2014. And these policies and, and procedures need to address what is clinically appropriate settings for the alarm signals, when it's appropriate for the alarm signals to be disabled altogether, when alarm parameters can be changed, who has the authority to set the alarm parameters? Is it your clinical engineering department? Is it the bedside nurse? Who has this authority? Um, who has the authority to, set, to turn the, the parameters off? And who's in charge of monitoring and responding to these alarm signals? Also, checking individual alarm signals for accurate settings, proper operation, and detectability. So why did the Joint Commission choose this initiative? There were 216 deaths between 2005 and 2010 related to alarm fatigue. 85% were false alarms. It turns into a, a boy who cried wolf scenario. There's one alarm every 90 seconds on most units, and 90% can go unanswered by the staff. So let's talk about IV pumps. That's why we're all here today, is to talk about these devices that we live with every day. So because we have them next to us, sometimes you kind of forget, why do we have them? We have them there in order to administer medications with precision. It also, they also provide security for us when we're administering medications that need to be locked up, such as narcotics. It also helps with patency. I'm sure as you all know that when you have a patient who has a line to gravity, sometimes the IV tubing can back up with, um, with blood, and it also overcomes some basic resistance. IV pumps are also involved in adverse drug events. 90% of inpatients receive IV medications, most of which are delivered via an IV pump. IV pumps are involved with 35 to 60% of the 700 adverse drug events that occur each year. So if you think about that, those are some pretty big numbers. <laughs> 
This is a comic that I thought was pretty funny from Nurse Marge in charge. It says, my two-year-old already recognizes the benefits of having a nurse for a mommy. He wakes up in the middle of the night by beeping like an IV. <laughs> okay, so how does this impact patient care? So, of course, when a patient is lying in bed and it hears this beep, 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 it's just, the patient can be disturbed, it can be awake from sleeping. The patient also experiences anxiety. When there are alarms going off, the patient might be thinking to themselves, what is that alarm? Did my heart stop? Am I going to die? And so they increase their anxiety. Also, there's extravasation and infiltration and missing medication. So I just want to take a moment now to talk about extravasation and infiltration. A lot of times people use these words interchangeably, even though they're really not. Infiltration is a non-vesicant medication administered into the surrounding tissue instead of in the intended vascular pathway. That's an infiltration. Remember, it's non-vesicant. Whereas an extravasation, so an infiltration is on the, on the, is the left photograph with the tape on the patient's arm. An extravasation is a vesicant medication administered into surrounding tissue instead of the intended vascular pathway. And unfortunately, the picture on the right is a result of an extravasation because it was a vesicant. So the definition of a vesicant is that it's an agent able of causing blistering, tissue, sloughing, or other necrosis when it escapes from the intended pathway into the surrounding tissue. Extravasation can be very serious. It can lead to patients having to have a skin graft or possibly even an amputation. It's very serious. On to our next poll question. So a vesicant is an agent capable of causing blistering, sloughing, necrosis, or all of the above? Very good. Just like our last question, very high percentage got that right. So a vesicant can cause all of those terrible things, blistering, sloughing, and necrosis. And remember that when you're using the vesicant medication, that's when you have the potential for an extravasation, which can lead to um, some very serious consequences. So how does this impact us, the staff? It can impact your job satisfaction, cl clinical complacency, anxiety in patients, and frustration. None of us went into this role in order to become frustrated and to become desensitized. We all came into this, into this role because we want to help people. And when we're constantly being barraged by all of these alarms, it can make you feel like you're not doing a good job and um, it can be very frustrating for the staff and lead to decrease RN satisfaction scores. So let's take a moment to talk about what does it mean to have an effective alarm. So effective alarms are appropriate, they're recognized, and the correct attention is being applied. So when we have an appropriate alarm, that means that your alarm is not just signaling for um, things that are super minor, like let's say your secondary medication switching back to your primary um, nor, uh, normal saline. So the nurse doesn't need to be called to be, alar to be alerted to know something as simple as that. It's also that the clinician needs to recognize which alarm requires the attention, which is step number three, right away. Now with the attention you have to make sure that the correct person is, is, um, is addressing these alarms. Now when I say the correct person, there's a scenario later where it's not the correct person, just giving you a little preview. So the, the third step of this with the attention, it has to be the person who has the know-how how to address the problem at hand. One fact that I found while researching this um, for this webinar was that if the alarm is likely to be accurate 90% of the time, then it will be answered 90% of the time. If the alarm is accurate only 10% of the time, then it will be answered only 10% of the time. So that appropriateness, that first step, is one of the things that becomes ingratiated in nursing minds. When you hear an alarm that you have determined is only 10% accurate, you're only going to answer it 10% of the time. So it's one of those things to, that it's really important to make sure that the alarms are um, signaling appropriately and not just signaling for minor things which, which don't require immediate attention.
So here we have our third poll question. Okay, so which of the following is not a part of the definition of an effective alarm? Appropriate, recognition, and attention, repetitive. Which one of these is not an example of an effective alarm? Okay, here we go, 89% actually got that one correct. When you have an alarm that is repetitive and keeps signaling over and over again, that can lead to desensitization. So the alarms being appropriate, being recognized by, by the correct staff and the correct staff members applying the attention are the three um, definitions of an effective alarm. Repetitive is not. So now we're gonna get into um, a discussion about the different types of IV pumps that you see every day. There's the syringe pump, the PCA, and the large volume infusion. So how these IV pumps work? So basically there are two, mostly it's these two different types of IV pumps that are being used in your institution. Of course there are other types that are less used, but most are either piston or peristaltic. So a piston is a syringe plunger that descends at very precise intervals, pushing the medication into the patient, and that's mostly your, your PCAs are the piston syringes, syringe pumps. And then you also have the peristaltic, which milks the tubing in the chamber or your set um, to pull the fluid from the bottle or bag through the tubing and into the patient. So this was a funny little comic that I saw. It says, everything looks okay. The tubing's not kink, so why does it keep beeping? And it's because it's our little friend, the roadrunner, and that's the only way he knows how to communicate. <laughs> okay. So how about those alarms that we've been talking about? Let's talk about the three main alarms that we encounter every day. The first one is occlusion alarms. And the way occlusion alarms work is that it's measuring the pressure sensors inside that set chamber. The air in line alarms utilizes ultrasonic transmitters and receivers to detect when air is being pumped. And the set disengagement is that the set sensors are not correctly inserted into the chamber. So those are the three main alarms that we hear. And now the next slide here has the breakdown of which alarms signal most frequently. So as you can see, the occlusion alarms account for a lot of the alarms that we're hearing. There's also the hold alarm, which happens when um, you forget to, to restart your, your IV fluid or your IV medication, and so that's 23%. But you can see that we have upstream occlusion and we have, excuse me, downstream occlusion is really taking up a lot of, a lot of our time. So let's br break down what it means to have an upstream occlusion as opposed to a downstream occlusion. So a downstream occlusion occurs between the pump and the patient, and there are two different types of downstream occlusions. We have hard occlusions and we have soft occlusions. So a hard occlusion is a result of high pressure building into the tubing over time, and hard occlusions can be influenced by rate and the elasticity of the pathway. So when you have a high infusion rate and you have it fast, set for 999 because you want to pump in some fluids into a patient who's a little bit hypotensive, then you're more likely to run into an occlusion. If you also have the elasticity of the pathway, um, it can be influenced by um, if you're, you're using an incredibly small gauge needle or, um, excuse me, a small gauge catheter or if you, your tubing is susceptible to the um, outside temperature of the room. Um, for example, a super hypothermic operating room could lead to stiffer tubing, which increases that high pressure inside the tubing and, send, and then signal a downstream occlusion alarm on your IV pump. Other example of hard occlusions that we run into is the closed stopcocks, kinked tubing and kinked catheters. Now we all know that when you have that kinked catheter underneath the skin, it's very hard to resolve. Um, that, that can happen when you have a patient who has an IV in the anacube. Okay, so that's the hard occlusions. Let's go on to the soft occlusions. So then we have this cute little kitten here that I've named Puff. And soft occlusions are built up um, of precipitates or emboli, and it also is compression of the tubing, compression of the catheter. Um, and when you have a soft occlusion, it takes a little bit of time for those 
um, for those uh, signals to build up inside the chamber in order to signal the RN. The pressure, the, the infusion of fluid is still able to go, to go past, but sometimes what a soft occlusion is trying to tell you is that you might have an infiltration or an extravasation. So there is a restriction of flow, but the flow is still able to get through. Soft occlusions take a little bit more time to signal, whereas a hard occlusion will signal immediately. A soft occlusion is going to take a little bit more time. Now, anytime you're experiencing a downstream soft occlusion, that's when you, your red flag should be going up in your head, signaling in your head that this might be an infiltration or an extravasation might be happening at that time. So let's talk a little bit about the resistance measurements. There's a, the resistance measurements um, in the space outside of the vein is at 1.2 millimeters of mercury, whereas inside the vein are measured at 0 0.02 millimeters of mercury. It's a pretty narrow um, margin of error that these pumps need to be um, attuned to. But at the same time, um, if you think about it, you don't want your pump to be too sensitive because if it is, then we go back to having inappropriate alarms. And remember what we had said about inappropriate alarms, that they, um, when they're, they're only 10% appropriate, only 10% are going to be responded to by the nurse. We become sensitized, desensitized, excuse me. So that there's a very small margin of error. So now this is the most important fact that I want you to take home with you today, is that IV pumps do not detect or protect your patients against extravasation and infiltration. The only thing that that pump is doing is measuring the pressure inside the tubing, inside that little set that you snapped into the machine. Some extravasations and infiltrations may develop under the detection of the pressure monitors in, on the pumps. So what you need to do is rely on your knowledge, rely on your years of experience and your nursing knowledge to ensure that your patients are safe from extravasation and infiltration. We can't rely on this technology to take care of it for us. All this is doing is measuring the pressure and saying, hmm, something's a little bit off with this pressure. But it's not saying, you know what, your patient has an extravasation with a vesicant medication, which could lead to your patient needing some very serious intervention. So that's an important fact that I really want you to remember today. Okay. So this is just reiterating, assessment of the IV site is the only surefire way to ensure that your patient is safe from extravasation and infiltration. And these IV alarms will not protect patients from these complications. So remember, when you see downstream occlusion signaling on your IV pumps, that that's when you need to assess your site. Assess your site. Don't take care of your technology. Take care of your patient, just like with when you have a cardiac alarm or when you have a, a ventilator alarm. Look at your patient. Treat your patient. Don't treat your technology. Okay, so now it's time to talk about upstream occlusions. Upstream occlusions are occlusions that occur between the IV solution or medication and the pump, and it can be caused by a multitude of factors. Um, not all IV pumps recognize whether you have upstream or downstream occlusions. So some of the causes of the upstream occlusion could be that you left the clamp on, uh, on the, on the upstream, excuse me, you re forgot to release the clamp, on the IV bottle or non, you forgot to release the vent on the bottle when you administer something like uh, nitroglycerin IV and it's still administered in those glass bottles. If you don't vent that, then you're going to signal an upstream occlusion. And also on medications that you use a filter, the filter might be clogged and you need to change that. So that's, that are, those are some of the ways to troubleshoot an upstream occlusion. And now it's time for poll question number four. Okay, here we go. What type of alarm will signal when the tubing is clamped between the IV bag and the pump? Is that an upstream occlusion, a downstream occlusion, air in line, or set disengaged? Remember, it's between the IV bag and the pump. Oh, very good. Upstream occlusion, you're right. When there is a clamp, that is an occlusion, that's a hard occlusion, and the 
It's an upstream occlusion because it's between the IV bag and the pump. If it's between the patient and the pump, it's considered a downstream occlusion. Thank you for voting, everyone. So how do we troubleshoot these alarms? When your alarm says air in line, a lot of times that can mean that your sensors are dirty inside the set chamber. That might need to be um, cleaned off. If there's an occlusion, remember we were just talking about check your clamps, check your filters, and with set disengagement, make sure that your set is lying appropriately inside the chamber on the IV pump. So here are some potential solutions. Number one, know your pump customized to accommodate your patient. So remember how we were talking a few moments ago about the patient that needs to have the bolus of um, the bolus of, of IV fluids because they're hypotensive. In that instance, if you have the volume up very high, you might, in, you might encounter a downstream occlusion alarm. So in order to customize, you can figure out, well, maybe can I start another IV in the other arm and administer this one a little bit more slowly so that way I don't have that occlusion alarm. Or you can slow down the rate in general and see if that will help to um, decrease that risk of a downstream occlusion alarm. There's also technology utilization. In my, um, in my time that I spent for researching this webinar, I learned about a technology um, that would signal RNs upon entering the patient's rooms rather than making a loud beep. So let's say you would have your phone or some sort of vibrating, um, maybe a pager on your hip. Um, that would, when you walk into the patient's room, then the signal would go off and it would say, your patient switched from your secondary infusion back to your primary infusion. So it's one of those things that it wouldn't pull you out of another patient's room if it's something that does not need to be addressed in an immediate nature. There's also traditional splints, which you could put on a patient's arm if they have an antecubital IV. And then there's also, um, the, the traditional splints also help us to prevent the kinking of the IVs. Arm boards are good for the IV, but bad for the patient. Um, one of the things that I'm finding in all of my years as working as a nurse is that there are a lot, not everything is black and white, and there's not a lot of easy solutions. So when we put these splints on patients, um, it, can, it causes the patient's arms to be restricted. There's also protective overlays, which is a new um, kind of idea that was created by a registered nurse who was working at the bedside, and she had a patient who had bilateral antecubital IVs, um, and of course they were signaling every time the patient had bent her arm. And so the nurse put bilateral splints on her arms, so the patient had to keep her arm straight, and then the patient's meal was delivered. So now this poor patient has food right in front of her, but her arm splinted. So it's a heartbreaking scenario. Um, so this nurse decided that she was going to try and design something that would help other patients that find themselves in this, search, in this situation. So how can a protective overlay help with IV pump alarms? So what a protective overlay is, is it's, it almost looks like a giant um, band-aid that would go over your antecubital IV there. And the foam, pla the foam pad split, splints the IV catheter and makes it that you can't bend your arm all the way up to touch your chin, but you can bend it a little bit, enough to feed yourself. It's not a securement device. What this device is, is something that goes over top of your, um, your stat lock or your, uh, your Tegaderm that you might be using to secure your line. Um, the foam pad sits over top of your, your traditional securement device. And it allows the patient to be mobile while still splinting the line. Um, this leads to re reduction of kinked catheters, which in turn leads to the reduction of new IV starts, which every patient, of course, wants to avoid a new IV start, and most nurses do too, unless you're a vampire. <laughs> okay, so you can see here that the line is kinked underneath the skin without the IV armor. And then this next one has the IV armor, which helps to straighten out that IV and keep it from kinking and keep you from getting those downstream heart occlusions.
Okay, so now the time has come for us to talk about some case studies here. So our first case study is that a patient is disoriented and agitated. The IV site in the left antecube is stable but not running continuously doing, due to the patient bending her arm. The IV alarm is signaling once every five minutes. The RN turns down the volume of the IV pump alarm so that it does not agitate the patient further. So first of all, let's talk about what type of occlusion is occurring here. So what we have here is a downstream occlusion because it is occurring between the patient and the IV pump. And what we also have here is that we have a kink in the IV, which is a hard occlusion. Now the next question is, did the RN take the correct action? I understand that the RN's heart is in the right place because the patient is disoriented and agitated and the alarm is upsetting the patient. And by turning down the alarm, the patient is having at least a little bit of relief from the signal. But I'm not sure if that was the safe decision for that patient. And what would you do in this situation? I know that if it were me, I would either, number one, I would use the IV armor if that was available to me, or number two, I could put a splint on that arm, which isn't actually the best solution, but it's something. And then number three, I would possibly start another IV in a different location, so that way the patient would be able to safely get the medication and be able to get some rest. But as I said, any time that you have a downstream occlusion, the most important thing that you can do is to observe the insertion site to ensure that extravasation and infiltration is not occurring on your patient. Remember to use the knowledge that you've built up all of these years that you've worked as a nurse. Case study B. The RN changes the bag of IV fluid in room, second, in room 7. A few minutes later, she hears the IV alarm and notices the message upstream occlusion on the pump. So let's think about this. How can the RN troubleshoot this alarm? So when your pump says upstream occlusion, that means that it is occurring between the pump and the IV bag. And some of the reasons why an upstream occlusion alarm might sound would be because you, um, your filter might need to be changed if you have a filter between the bag and the, and the IV pump. You might need to vent your, um, your bottle, your glass bottle of medication, um, or there might be a clamp that's going on. But remember, the upstream occlusion occurs between the IV pump and the IV fluid or medication. Case study C. Patient IV pump is alarming every time the patient bends her wrist. The patient is becoming increasingly frustrated at the interruptions and is refusing a new IV in a different location. As a last resort, the RN shows the patient how to restart the IV pump and how to silence the alarm. Now, I know that this sounds crazy, but I've seen this happen more than once in my 20 years of practice. What would you do in this situation? Would you instruct a patient on how to turn down the alarms and how to restart the pump? This goes back to our earlier discussion about what it means to have an effective alarm. The last section of that slide talked about having the correct person address the alarms. And that means it's someone who has the education and knowledge of what these alarms mean. Even if the patient is a registered nurse, you still should not allow the patient to, um, to uh, touch the pump controls and to regulate their own medications. And our last case study here is an IV pump alarm. The IV pump is alarming that there's an occlusion downstream. What is the first thing that the RN should look for when assessing the line? So remember what I said that downstream occlusions should signal, send a red flag into your head that your patient is at risk to have an infiltration or an extravasation. And remember, the difference between infiltration and extravasation is extravasation is caused by a vesicant and can lead to very serious patient complications. So the first thing the RN should do is assess the patient. Don't, um, don't take care of your technology. Take care of your patient. Once the patient, RN looks at the patient, make sure that that IV site still looks okay. Then you can look at the tubing, see is there, is there a clamp or is the line kinked somewhere. So this is a little comic I thought was funny. It says, when the line goes flat and the beeping stops, call me. 
Okay, so in summary, today we um, discussed the risks associated with alarm fatigue, and those risks are that the, the alarms can be silenced, ignored, or disabled, which can lead to very serious patient complications and even to death. We also talked about the sources of IV pump alarms, occlusion, air in line, and set disengagement. Occlusion are the upstream occlusions and downstream occlusions, soft occlusions and hard occlusions. And lastly, we talked about the role of IV protection in the reduction of these alarms. The IV protection, which remember goes over top of your original securement, prevents kinking of the IV catheter and is able to save your patients from IV sticks and save you from hearing a lot of these IV alarms. So that about wraps up my, um, my presentation. I'm open for questions. Thank you for your attention. So this is Joanne. Just as a reminder, the continuing education accredit, um, hour information is on the slide that you see now. We've had some very, uh, very important uh, questions that uh, the participants have brought up, Catherine. So um, first, I want to thank, um, give a shout out and a thanks to Michelle, who sent us information about uh, standards from the Infusion Nurses Society, which um, the 2006 uh, standards were updated in 2011, and they're currently being revised, and we can look forward to them uh, being released in uh, early uh, 2016. So thanks uh, for that information, um, Michelle. Thank you, Michelle. So the first question, uh, Catherine, is uh, about uh, from Karen, who they, uh, in their organization, they use Alaris pumps, and she wanted to know if there's any software to stop the, um, the beep, so to, to stop the beeping once the patient unbends their arm. I have not heard about that from Alaris. <laughs> what I would suggest is talking to the Alaris rep. I'm sorry. That sounds like a really great idea um, to have the IV start again once the um, once the patient straightens out their arm. I know that there are some IV pumps that um, will continue to try to continue to infuse after the initial signal of having a hard downstream occlusion, which uh, it sounds like that's what you're experiencing. And so, and um, there are some, but, th but the window is very small. It's only, I'd say, maybe between 15 seconds and 30 seconds where if a patient bends their arm, it's, it's, it's sensing, 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 I'm running into um, a higher pressure here, then the patient straightens their arm and it does continue to flow. But that sensing part, which we were just um, describing as a patient bending their arm, that sensing, sensing time is very short. Um, I understand that this would be a really uh, interesting technology to have as, as like a, a lengthened um, period of time longer than the short period that it is currently. Um, but then you also have to worry about the fact that if it um, if if you're misreading something that might be an extravasational or infiltration that it might lead to some danger. Um, it would have to only be for hard occlusions. It wouldn't be able to be for soft occlusions. Um, but that's a very interesting. Um, it's a very interesting question, um, but I know that that technology exists, but it's only for a short period of time right now for Alaris. I would ask the Alaris representatives to see if that period of time can be extended. The technology does exist. But. All right, great, thank you. Um, Catherine asks a great question about uh, the temperature of solutions. For, for uh, solutions such as antibiotics that are refrigerated, mm. um, they create micro bubbles that are naked to mm -hmm. our eye and set mm -hmm. off the alarm with the IV pumps. Do you have any strategies for us to be able to manage those types of solutions? Mm -hmm. That's a great question. Um, one of the things that you can do is make sure that your sensors are clean inside of your, um, your set, inside the peristaltic chamber there, um, because sometimes it gets to be that um, if there's a little bit of debris in there that it might um, be oversensitive to seeing those tiny micro bubbles. <coughs> okay, great. Uh, Rob asks, uh, if you could readdress the connection between alarms and infiltration and extravasation. Uh, it's sure. a little bit unclear about that relationship. Sure. So I'm going to see if I can go back in my slides here. So when you have, this is considered a downstream occlusion. So let's say that you have um, a patient, oh, wait, I'm uh, sorry, I went 
too far back. Let me see here, waiting for this to catch up. Okay, so we have a, a downstream occlusion. So you are, let's, let's picture this, that you're on your unit and you hear the alarm. You go into the patient's room and you see on your pump it says downstream occlusion. Remember, there's two different types of downstream occlusion. So your pump is going off, it says downstream occlusion. The first thing you need to do is look at your patient, okay, because your pump is trying to tell you that the pressure within the chamber is getting high, okay? So if you look at this slide here where it measures the different pressures, hold on just a second, here it is. The resistance of the space outside the vein is 1.2 millimeters of mercury per ml of pumping rate, whereas inside the vein it's 0 0.02 uh, millimeters of mercury for each ml hour of pumping rate. So if you, um, this, this, what this is telling you is that the pump is recognizing that there is, it's meeting pressure. It's meeting some pressure. And it's saying there's a good chance that your patient's fluid or medication is being administered into that space between the skin and the vein and not inside the vessel where it needs to be. That's what the pump is, the pump is signaling there's high pressure. The pump doesn't know why there's high pressure. The pump just knows there's high pressure. And so it's up to you to determine why does this pump think that there's high pressure in, in this line? And the first thing you should think to yourself, well, maybe it's high pressure because of the difference in the resistance between inside the vein and outside the vein. Maybe that's the pressure that the, that the pump is measuring right now and the pump is recognizing that the pressure has gone up and maybe it's because it's outside the vein. So that's a downstream occlusion, and it's a soft occlusion typically. And when you have that fluid going into that space between your skin and your vein, you can have an infiltration, which means that it's a non-vesicant medication, or you can have an extravasation, which means that it is a vesicant medication. And for vesicants, that, those are the super strong medications that can cause a lot of damage to your patient's tissue. Those medications are designed to be, um, to not sit in one place because if you're outside of the vein, it's not traveling through the circulatory system. It's just sitting in that space between the skin and the vein and it's eating away at that, at that tissue there. So that's why when you see a downstream occlusion on your IV pump, all that pump knows is that the pressure is high. It doesn't know why the pressure is high. The first thing you need to do is look at your patient's, and your patient's IV site and make sure that it's not swollen, it's not hot to the touch, it's not red. Once you assess your IV site and ensure that your patient is safe, then look at your tubing. Do you have a kink? Do you have your clamp on? Does the filter need to be changed? But the most important thing you need to do is to treat your patient. Don't treat your technology. I hope that that helped answer your question. Great. Um, Catherine, I just want to tag on um, when you talked about technology, um, uh, a recent question that just came in. Um, do you have any experience with IV pump alarms going to nurses' phones? No, I haven't heard about that. I, I did read about the technology of um, not necessarily to a phone, but to some type of device. Mm -hmm. um, I did read about the technology that the IV pumps could signal um, over to, to a device of some sort. It wasn't necessarily a phone. I mean, I imagine that it would be a phone. It did not say that in the article that it was a phone. Um, uh, but yeah, it's to some sort of handheld device that would signal to the RN rather than to the patient or in the patient's room, this big loud alarm, it would vibrate on your hip. Um, so yes, I did hear about that. Okay. Um, our next question from Todd, do pumps uh, at a specific pressure limit or um, rate change in the pressure or, or cha rate change in the pressure in the system? Or I'm sorry, let me read that again. Do pumps at a specific <laughs> pressure limit the rate or pressure in the system? Say it one more time, Joe. Um, do pumps at a specific pressure limit? Let me, let me go back to the exact Maybe question. I think that what he's asking is what is the pressure limit inside the pump yeah. for as it relates to the rate 
I hope that that's what you're asking because that's what I'm going to answer. Um, okay, so it depends not only on the rate. The rate is one of the factors that can influence whether or not you're going to run into higher pressure inside your IV pump. Um, the, the rate, if you have a high rate, it's going to increase your pressure inside, that, inside your IV pump. If you have a low rate, let's say, at KVO, you know, 40 mLs an hour, that's a nice low pressure. But it's not just your rate, it's also um, your gauge. If you have a tiny little 24 gauge needle, then think about the pressure that's required to push medication or fluid through a very narrow, um, a narrow catheter like that. The pressure's higher than it would be than if, you, let's say, you had a nice big fat 16 in someone. Um, that that uh, the lower the, um, the the lower the gauge, the higher the volume that can go through. So so the pumps are all they're measuring is pressure. Um, all they're measuring is pressure, and whether the pressure comes from the amount of volume being infused or through the um, the gauge and the width of the needle. Um, all, all the pump knows is that the pressure is not what I anticipated it to be. And it's up to you as the clinician to understand, well, is it because I have a tiny little 22 gauge in someone's anticube that's probably kinked? Or is it because I'm running this at 999 and because I'm trying to infuse too much volume through too delicate of an IV? Or is it because the pressure is building up because the patient's sitting on their tubing? or their IV um, pole is rolled over the tubing, um, that's up to your assessment. All your pump is telling you is that you have an occlusion somewhere between the pump and the patient. I hope that that helps to answer your question. I don't know the exact measurements of pressure. That's a, ver that's a good question. I don't know the exact measurements of pressure which signal each pump to, um, to alarm the nurse or to inform the nurse. Okay, great. Um, the next question is from Vincenzo. Um, do you have a step-by-step -step process for assessing occlusions, not just IV site assessment? So the first thing you do when you have occlusion and you walk into a patient's room and the, and the alarm pump is signaling occlusion, first look at your patient step-by-step. -step. You say, okay, is, is the patient's arm swollen? Is the patient's arm red? Um, does this appear to be infiltrated or extravasated? That's your first step. Okay, second step, let's take a, let's take a, if, if everything looks good in that patient's IV site, what's going on? What's the next step? Okay, let's see, do we leave a clamp on somewhere? Um, is there a filter that needs to be changed? Is, um, is the vent released on the medication? Um, is there a kink in the IV, either underneath the skin or at the insertion site? Um, those, are, those are the steps that you need to take when you um, encounter an occlusion alarm, okay? It's, some pumps uh, designate whether they're upstream or downstream. If it says it's downstream, remember, that's between the pump and the patient. So that could be a clamp, that could be an infiltration, that could be a kink in the IV. And remember, an upstream occlusion is between the IV fluid and the, uh, the IV pump. And that can also be um, a, a clamp that's on or a filter that needs to be changed or your um, medication is not vented. One of the other things you could do is um, maybe it's your pump. Maybe your pump is malfunctioning, which is something that doesn't typically happen, but it's something to be considered. If everything looks good and your patient's not complaining of pain at your IV site and all of your line looks like it's clear, maybe something's up with the pump. So you could pause the pump and flush your IV. See if you have a nice, easy flush. If you have an easy flush, then you know it's not your line, that it might be something with the pump. Um, but those are the steps that I would take if I were in your shoes. Okay. Um, a couple of I'm going to put a couple of questions together from Diane and Christina about the, um, the IV armor. Um, is there a concern that if the IV armor is in place that the IV catheter would move under this, un, you know, in, out of, uh, out of the, uh, the vein mm -hmm. and then um, to, to to add on to that um, question, this is, I think, a great question. Is the IV armor considered a restraint, and how long can it oh. be left on for? Wow, that's a really great question. Yeah, I think so, too. 
That's a great question. Well, the first question is that the to answer the first question about securement, this goes over top of your um, your standard securement that you're already using, your tegaderm, which keeps that line inside of your vein. Um, now, remember when you start IVs, and this might be getting a little bit too technical, but remember when you're starting your IVs that you want to make sure that you have the most purchase on your catheter. If you only have a small amount of purchase between your catheter, in, in small amount of, of like the, uh, the, the very tip of the catheter is the only thing that is inside the vein, then you're going to run into problems. Um, but if you have a good purchase with your IV, just as you would um, with, with having a patient that bends their arm up and down, that IV armor should be able to keep it in place. And I don't believe that it would cause an increase in infiltrations. As for a, um, that's a very interesting question about it being a type of restraint. I had never thought of that before. Um, I would refer that to the manufacturer, which is Dale. Um, well, I've worn the IV armor, armor myself, and I suppose it's a restraint in the sense that I can't reach, you can't, you can't, you can, uh, it, you can't really reach like behind your shoulder blade. Like let's say if I was going to take my left hand and reach behind my head and touch my right shoulder blade, I'm still able to do that, but it's a little bit uncomfortable. I wouldn't think that it's a restraint. Um, it's not super stiff. Um, I had never heard, Joanne, maybe you know, had you ever heard of splints being considered a restraint, an IV splint? The traditional ones? Uh, no, no, but I think it's a great question for the regulatory compliance folks in your organization that they might have some insight into that as well because it's a relatively new product. Um, I think it's a, it's a great to put on the table for the regulatory compliance folks. So I'm just going to ask one more question and then we'll uh, wrap things up um, from Pam. What about central lines and pick lines when you have a number of different uh, different lines going into the same access point. Any, okay. Any thoughts on that? Sure. So let's say you have, um, let's say you have a double, let's say you have a double lumen pick and you have medication that is being administered to the blue port and the red port, okay? Um, so of course you walk into the room and there's an, an occlusion alarm. Um, the first thing you want to figure out is which, which port is it going into. Um, and if both, uh, both ports are actually alarming, then that would signal to me that it has something to do with the end of the pick or the end of the central line. You might have some sort of um, fibrin sheath on the end, in which case you would administer, um, in our institution, we administer TPA. We have a TPA dwell that sits at the end of that line just to kind of eat up the end of that fibrin sheath. So the first thing you need to recognize is, is it the blue port? Is it the red port? Is it both ports? I'm just using blue and red arbitrarily. I'm not, um, I'm not signaling that those are the only types um, at any rate. So first step is figure out, is it the blue port? Is it the red port? Is it both ports? If it's both ports, then that means that it's the line in some sort. It's not necessarily the tubing. It's not the pump. It's, it's the line. Either the line is kinked, as I had said, or it has an eye, it might have a fibrin sheath at the end of the line inside the vena cava, or perhaps you have your clamps on. Everybody has done that when you forget to unclamp it, and you're just like, oh, man, how did I forget that? At any rate, but those are, those are the things that you troubleshoot for when you have multiple infusions going in through the same line. If it's, remember, any time that you are getting an occlusion alarm, it's because the pressure is not what the pump intended, what the pump thought it was going to be, not what the pump anticipated. So it's not anticipating for there to be this pressure. It's not going to tell you why you have pressure. It's just going to say you have pressure. As I said, if both pumps are going off for both lines, that means it's your pick. It's your central line. And as I said, you could have a fibrin sheath, you could have a clamp that's on there, or it could be kinked underneath the skin. Well, that's great. Thank you, Catherine. We're going to go back one slide because we're going to need to wrap things up. This has been an, a really great um, opportunity for all of us. Um, I want to take this opportunity to thank um, Dale uh, Products for the sponsorship of this program, and I want to thank Catherine for contributing her fabulous expertise to the program. It's and, my pleasure. Uh, I think that wraps it up for us for today. And thank you to the audience for your um, for your attention.
the, the questions have been really, really helpful, and, and I think they help us to, to expand our knowledge all the time. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, Catherine. Thank you, Joanne. Thank you so much for everything you've shared with us today. The information is vitally important to the reduction of nuisance alarms. And finally, last but not least, I'd like to thank each and every one of you, our guests in the audience today, for your time and your very thoughtful attention. Thank you, everyone. Take care, and bye for now.